So, David, you've written a book about sex. Yes, I've written this book, Sex by Numbers, available in all good bookshops, and uh, it's a book about statistics. And uh, it actually is a book about statistics and statistical ideas and statistical methods using sex as an example. And, of course, it's got you know, all sorts of you know, numbers and the interesting things. I think, hope people will think these are great stories. But there's a, you know, my, my uh, ulterior purpose, of course, is to get in people interested in a, in a critical approach to, to the numbers that they hear about in the news or, or elsewhere. Sex is a great topic because, um, you know, we know there's lots going on, but we don't know what goes on or how much is all, you know, most of the time anyway, goes on behind closed doors and people might be quite reluctant, um, you know, to, uh, to, to say what's happening. So it, it, it's a, a really a, a, a difficult topic to investigate scientifically, but it's necessary. And, uh, and so it's a real challenge for statistics. So what um, aspects of these, the data to do with um, sex and sexual attitudes, what kind of interesting statistical ideas come up in, those, in that kind of data? Well, one thing I do in the book is to try to say that you know, not all the numbers we hear about um, in terms of sexual behaviour or anything are equally valuable. So I give them star ratings, which is, right, which is quite rough. So four star would be numbers we actually believe. So in sex, for example, we might, we might know the number of births, well, we know pretty well the number of abortions, we know the number of registered sexually transmitted diseases, but of course that's not actually necessarily you know, all the disease that's there, uh, and so on. So sometimes we, you know, we've got some good statistics. Um, and then the you know, next level down, three star, are the good surveys. I talk a lot about the, the British um, and National Survey of Sexual Attitudes and Lifestyles, which um, you know, is... They really try hard. They, they spend a lot of money, a lot of effort to get a random sample of people, to try to get as many people to respond, to try to get, make sure people answer accurately by ensuring confidentiality. Um, people are interviewed uh, with, a, with a computer that they, they fill up their answers. The interviewer doesn't see any of the responses. It's all closed up, locked, etc. So they done, do everything they can to try to get accurate answers. And, um, and so those are pretty good. They're not great. You know, you know, I would say they're accurate about 20% or so. Two star are the ones, now we're getting a little bit ropier, are the ones, for example, you know, people set up internet panels now, um, you know, the, which they try to make balance the population, but they're still volunteers, and you really don't know whether they're you know, biased towards one way or another to some extent. So they're not bad. Because then we get stuck getting really bad ones. Ones where you know, all the standard websites will click here if you want to answer our, our sexual questions and things like that. No, it's going to be hopelessly unreliable in terms of the sample of people you've got. I mean, it'll show what some people do, what the readers of this website might do or believe, but it's not going to be representative of, 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 of the general population. And then zero stars are ones that just people just make up. What's one that people have just made up? Oh, I know, the, there's some lovely historical ones about, um, you know, the, 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 I, like, I really like these old-fashioned ones, the 18th century, the 18th, the 19th century ones about the, the you know, the terrible um, harm of, of, um, of, 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 um, of masturbation and having an orgasm, you know, is, uh, oh, is the equivalent to losing, you know, so many ounces of blood, you know, so uh, the, the, this is encouraging consonants in, 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 in everybody. Um, and the, the men thinking about sex every seven seconds and all that. Kind of not true no not true interesting inter amazing experiments that people have tried to do about how often people do think about sex so just asking someone is quite tricky so but then they they give people little clickers to record how often as they wander around how often they're thinking about sex and that varies enormously and um, you know among people well, but you know, the, and you find out that people think about food more than they think about sex <laughs> And then they uh, have tried giving people smartphones and uh, actually phoning them at, or buzzing them at random times of the day and asking them, are you thinking about sex now? <laughs> and of course they don't find it's not like anything like seven seconds. You know, it varies enormously from person to person, but it generally is only going to be a few times a day. What's one of the stories, what's one of your favourite stories from the book? One issue that comes up again and again in surveys of sexual behaviour is that if you ask people how many sexual partners have you had during your lifetime, men admit to having, or claim to have had far more than women do on average. But mathematically, in a closed population of the same number of men and women, the average in terms of the mean number of sexual partners should be the same, opposite sex sexual partners, should be the same. 
And yet, um, for example, um, on average, the people surveyed in this survey, the men said they had 14 sexual partners on average, and the women say seven. Now, that, there's a lot of things about that average. First of all, it's an average of a distribution, which is nowhere near symmetric around that average. In fact, if you ask 35 to 40 year, 45 year olds, the most common number of sexual, opposite sexual, sex, sexual partners they've had is one, precisely one. That's the mode of the distribution is at one. And then it's got this enormously long tail, um, out, out of 500 or something. I guess just goes shooting out like that. But the average of this distribution is different for the men and, and women. So people are really thinking, why is this the case? You know, why do men say they've had more sexual partners than women? All sorts of theories have been suggested. So one theory that you know, people have said, oh, this explains it, is that um, men are going to prostitutes. And so you know, that's where their sexual partners come from. And because prostitutes don't get into the survey, who have had huge numbers of sexual partners, that downweights the average number for women. Um, I, the people who do the British survey don't think that is a, a, you know, such a big influence, but some people claim it is. So another way is to look at just how people answer the question, and, and the data itself reveals interesting patterns on that, because I said this distribution, if you ask people, they've got this distribution with a peak at one and a great long tail. Okay, then for low numbers, people count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, etc., etc. Then it all starts getting a bit lumpy because people stop being able to count exactly on their fingers or their toes and they start saying, well, 15, 20, 25, great lump on 30, 50, etc. You know, people just say making rough estimates. Now, and it's been said also that, oh, well, men just make these rounded figures, whereas women count them individually. Actually, that's not the case either. Women are giving rounded figures as well. So there's a suggestion that men tend to round up, maybe, and women tend to round down, which I think you know, is probably quite an influence. There's another factor, though, is what people count as a sexual partner. Um, in the surveys, they give a very strict instruction of what counts as a sexual partner. But actually, um, in practice, women may not count or want to count um, relationships that they want to forget, uh, for which there was some coercion, and so on. So they actually may not give the same number um, as, as, as men might. And you've always got this thing of, of social acceptability bias, as it's known. It's just that you know, there's a natural feeling, perhaps, to some extent, of it being more respectable for, for men to say they've had lots of sexual partners than it is for women. Given that, um, given that gathering data on this kind of topic is, is so difficult. I mean, what does statistics and probability bring to it to, to help make um, the evidence more reliable or to judge the evidence better? Yeah, I think, well, it, gives you, it can give you an idea of the reliability of the data by making statistical comparisons. So uh, the good surveys check all the time. They check you know, within a, a, question, a, a series of questions about consistency, but then they look at consistency across um, different cohorts of people. So it's interesting because the big surveys have been done in 1990, 2000 and 2010. For example, in 2000, you can ask um, 20 year olds, uh, did you have sex before you were 16? And then in 2010, you ask 30 year olds, did you have sex before you were 16? And you should get the same answer. They're not the same people, but up to chance, they should get the same answer. You're asking about the same event. Did you or, and, and if there's a difference, you know there's an inconsistency there. Now, it turns out that between 2000 and 2010, you get fairly consistent results between people. But between 1990 and 2000, there seems to be uh, an increase in the willingness to accept, uh, to report behaviour such as having sex early, um, same-sex experience, masturbation, and so on. So there's... Um, so that looks like it's a, by doing that, quite using quite clever statistical tricks, you can work out to some extent the reliability of your data. What's one of the most surprising facts that people might learn when oh, they read yes, the book? Yeah. The one, I was amazed by this. And every year, the Office of National Statistics reports how many boys and how many girls have been born in this country. And we know, you know it's pretty reliable that there's 105 boys born for every 100 girls. There's always more boys born than girls, just for whatever reasons. That's the, what happens. But that, and that ratio is known as the sex ratio. And uh, they report it back to 1837, when good you know, um, national records started being reported. And if you plot that, I don't think anyone's ever plotted it. If you plot it, you, you don't just get random variation. 
from year to year. You get a very systematic pattern. And do you know when the absolute peaks are of when more boys are born than at any other time in history? 1919 and 1945. And what happened at 1919 and 1945? More boys are born at the end of wars. It's the same in the US. The peak is in 1946 for the number of boys born. In the US, in 1946, the peak is, and it's repeated after the First World War in various other countries as well. It is actual fact, four star, uncontrovertible, that more boys are born at the end of wars. And why do you and think? why would that be exactly? If people have come up with all sorts of theories of that, all sorts of evolutionary biological theory, there's this Trivers Willard hypothesis that by some mechanism that um, females can, to a small extent, control the gender of their offspring as that which is most suitable to the environment. And this has been, you know, people think this has been observed in, in, in animals that um, high ranking mates of high ranking males, dominant males, might have more boys because that's what's suited to their, to, to, uh, to uh, the, the, um, the family. So, so there's that suggestion that almost somehow boys are needed so they could be sort of popped out by women. I find this deeply suspicious. I just don't, don't believe it, to be honest. But there's also a finding, a very common finding, that um, uh, more boys tend to be born to young women and particularly um, increased sexual activity seems to lead to more boys. Now, why would having a lot of sex lead to more boys? Now, and the point is that a lot of sex is fairly, um, uh, you know, I think uncontroversial to think that for at the end of wars, with soldiers home on leave, particularly soldiers being demobbed and coming home, that there's going to be fairly intense sexual activity. We know that huge numbers of babies are born. More bo babies were born in 1919 in this country than any other year. In, 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 so we know there's intense sex at the end of wars. So why more intense sex lead to more boys? Well, the first thing is that more intense sex leads to babies being conceived at different time of the cycle. There's, um, yeah, women have a, a, a distribution of fertility or throughout the cycle with a peak around two days before ovulation where a young woman has got you know, at least 50% chance of, of conceiving from a single act of sex and maybe a lot higher than that. So, um, but if you have sex intensely, you're home on leave, you have a lot of sex, then um, you're more likely to conceive early on in the cycle because you, you're likely to be pregnant before the, the peak to fertility time. So intense sex leads to um, conceptions to some extent being um, having early on in the cycle. And there's another theory that says that uh, babies conceived at different times in the cycle uh, to a small extent have different um, genders. That boys, that babies conceived early on in the cycle tend to be boys for reasons not really well explained, but for, you know, for it's quite plausible hormonal reasons why that might be the case. Okay, so there's the theory that more intense sex leads to more boys because they are conceived at a different time. Now, the point is that you may argue about that, but there's, it, it leads to another possible evidence for another great mystery of babies and sex. How did the Victorians stop having babies? In the 1850s, Victorians used to have five, six babies each, natural fertility that people still do in some parts of Africa. And they reduced it by, by the start of the 20th century, people were having two babies each on average. A massive reduction in fertility in this country. Huge change. Without artificial contraception, it wasn't used very much at all. We do know that. There were some condoms being used and some use of sponges and things, but really very little use of artificial contraception. So how did they stop having, having babies? And historians have argued about this for ages. It turns out that if you plot the sex ratio, the proportion of boys being born dropped steadily throughout that whole period at the end of the Victorian period, reaching an absolute rock bottom around 1898-1900. Proportionally more girls were born at any other time in history around about 1898-1900. And this suggests if, the, if more boys means more sex, more girls means less sex. So the fact that fewer girls, fewer boys were being born suggests that sexual activity, the intensity of sexual activity, was dropping throughout the entire Victorian period, reaching a rock bottom around about the turn of the century. Which reinforces the historian's idea that the reason people didn't have babies is because they weren't having sex. And the idea of abstinence or continence is what was known. Now, that was part of the Victorian culture, really promoted by people. And sex once a month was quite enough, if, even, even, even if that was slightly excessive. So that was actively promoted that abstinence and continence as a, as a was just a part of decent human behaviour. But women were choosing this 
this, all this evidence now suggests women were choosing this as a way just to have, avoid having babies. They didn't have sex. As well as a great read, what do you hope people will take away from reading this book? Oh, a number of things. I think the first thing is that, um, you know, when you see a number, think about, can I believe this? And maybe provide some tools for, for you know, actually checking whether you can believe them or not. So that's my star rating system. I just use a simple way to say, these are, some of these numbers are great. I don't believe them. You know, can we, can we just sort of, do we know how it's constructed, how it's arrived at? Is it plausible? Just think about it. Is this number plausible? So don't read it. You know, I don't think people do believe all the numbers they hear, particularly not on, on sex. I mean, you just Google, you know, 10 sex statistics and you find out all this drivel comes out. But some of them are, are good. Some of them are right. And I cover all sorts of stuff about, you know, you know behavior and, you know, length of time people have sex for and all that sort of stuff. And some of this data, actually, though, is rather good. So the other thing I want people to realize is that you actually can get some decent data in a really tricky areas by, um, first of all, by d doing questionnaires on people, you know, and interviewing them in a, in a really, making a lot of effort into it, very expensive, but also by doing experiments, extraordinary experiments that people do, randomised experiments where you take groups of people and you randomly allocate them to different interventions and then to see, um, you know, what the, uh, what the effect is. Um, so, for example, th there's a lovely one on, on the partnership one where they took most of these courses are psychology students, usually American psychology students, unfortunately, but that's who they got access to. So they took groups of people and randomly allocated them to fill up a, a sex questionnaire on, on uh, including how many partners have they had. But one group of people, um, you know, were guaranteed confidentiality. Another group of people thought that their questionnaire could be read by one of their colleagues because after they filled it in, uh, they knew that one of their colleagues was going to come and pick it up and walk out the door with it and could easily read it. And another group were wired up to this machine with all wiggly lines and told it was a lie detector. Because it wasn't. They're completely spurious. <laughs> they, it's called a bogus pipeline experiment. They do lots of these fake lie detectors. And what did they find? That the people wired up to the lie detector admitted to having more sexual partners and the people who thought their, um, you know, their questionnaire might be read. The women admitted to having fewer. So for women, if they think they're going to be the answers might be seen, they'll put yeah, down less. Lower, lower, yes. Not so evident in men, but, but in, in women that was definitely the case. So that's a nice experiment. The other extraordinary experiments are things like um, working out about... <laughs> um, it's a bit of a mystery, you know, the sort of things people get up to, you know, in sex are not things they would normally think of doing. You know, all this connection with another person, all the sort of body parts and, uh, you know, liquids and things like that. So th there's a basic, basic idea that maybe sexual arousal reduces your disgust response. In other words, you're willing to do more things. If you're sexually aroused, you're actually willing to do some things you wouldn't normally want to do. So great experiment. So they show, randomly allocate people to watch different sorts of videos. And um, one is a uh, sexually arousing video, a bit of soft porn. There's men, men and women. Sexually. One is a very neutral video, um, a, you know, it's like a, a train journey. I, would th I think I'd find that rather arousing myself. <laughs> and another one is what is watching, uh, no, I can't remember the third intervention. Well, anyway, you know, so these different types of videos. And then they get them to do, ask them to do various disgusting things. Um, sticking a pin into a cow's eye, eyeball, um, you know, handling used tissues, handling used panties, which actually you know, were stained with something else, and putting their hand into a, a bowl of apparently used condoms which hadn't been, but they had been smeared with this stuff. And the investigators had this vivid imagination of these disgusting things. And what do they do? They found out that the people who had just seen the, the uh, arousing film were, were more willing to do these apparently disgusting tasks. That's a lovely note to end on, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, David, thank you so much for talking to us about your book, and um, we look forward to hearing more. Thank you very much.